Dit is Main Street Los Altos. Los Altos is een heel klein dorpje in Silicon Valley. Twee kilometer die kant op ligt het hoofdkantoor van Apple. Maar hier boven die kledingwinkel zit zo'n typische start-up die je hier ziet in Silicon Valley. In een heel klein, aftans lelijk kantoortje zit het nieuwe bedrijf van Michael Gifford, de ongekroonde koning van de hardware van Silicon Valley. Hij werkte bij Sun op de Spark Station, bij Apple op de Macintosh producten, bij Microsoft op de Xbox. Hij weet alles van hardware, is bezig met iets nieuws, heet Wim Labs. Nepnaam zegt hij ook, gaat straks absoluut anders heten. Met kerst moeten producten al verkrijgbaar zijn. Hij wil niet vertellen wat het is. Het is allemaal stelf, maar we gaan toch kijken. It really is a great time here in the Valley. There's a lot of activity, there's a lot of innovation and creative that I think has been, has been stifled a little bit. The economy has put a little bit of a dark cloud on things, but uh, you know, I, I think that most of the folks that we interface with here in the Valley are really excited about the next step of technology. And why is that right now? Is it because you think the recession is behind us or just because of the state of technology right now? I don't think that personally, and my personal views on this are that I, you know, I don't think the recession is behind us yet. I think we still have uh, a little bit of difficult times in front of us. However, being here in the Valley, this really is about innovation and creation. And the technology continues to move forward. There's momentum and inertia in technology. There's momentum in inertia. Every year, a new group of young people come out of college who are very eager and anxious to, to build and create something. And as long as we stimulate that creativity, I think it will always be there. There's a business economic, there's an obvious business economic that's going to be challenging. Funding for startups companies today, depending on what you're doing, whether you're doing biomedical or you're doing software, or you're doing net-based services or consumer products, uh, depending on which one of these segments, it could be energy, it could be green initiatives, there's a variety of, of areas you could go innovate and create things in. Um, interestingly enough, some of those are being funded very well today, some of them aren't. I think if you wanted to do a a consumer good, a sub $300 consumer item today, it might be a little bit challenging to... Uh... <laughs> so what are you guys doing? Well, I, of course, you know how this works. I can't really tell you that today. Because now you're called Wim Labs. Uh, I'm with a company called Wim Labs, absolutely. Which we I, know already now is not going to be your name. Uh, no question about it. Uh, that will not be our You sound like a German uh, company making something against a skin rash. <laughs> this comes out of Wim Labs. Uh, okay. Buy this. <laughs> <laughs> Zermat Systems, what is that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to write that down because that could be our description. <laughs> well, in Europe is, you launch with a lot of brouhaha. And you always yes. say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to be huge, and you never hear from them again. Here, you start with Wim Labs. Right. And then what? Well, Wim Labs, and that's the fun part about having a name and a, an identity as you start a company. It, it doesn't have a purpose yet. It doesn't have a purpose to the outside world. It clearly has meaning to us. When we have... And, and as you know, startups, generally speaking, start with a very wide goal. You have a very broad, big goal that over time narrows itself. And it goes through an evolution. As we go through that evolution, we don't want to worry about the outside world. We want to worry about ourselves. So our natural evolution and what's going to happen and the product we're going to build and the, the, the true value proposition that we're creating as a small group and as a team working with partners on the outside is completely unadulterated by the outside world. So that when we get to the point where we're ready to launch it to the world, then we can put that facing brand on it. It hasn't been used. It hasn't been seen. It can be fresh and clean. And as you know, it's not easy to come up with a brand with a name and identity that's going to resonate well with consumers. That's a very difficult thing to do. It really is. Yeah. So if you come up with something that you think is going to resonate and it's going to work for you here, hold it, set it in reserve, bring it to the table when it's the appropriate time to do that. The difference between here, I think, and Europe, I, I met with a company. I was doing some consulting uh, in Switzerland in June. I met with a really interesting company who wanted for the first time to build a consumer item. I've built quite a few consumer items, so I was asked to come and talk to them a little bit about what does it take to start with this idea we have and go build a product over here? How long is it going to take? What's the process you're going to go through? How do you do this? Because Switzerland you know, hasn't been, except for watches, great at manufacturing, I think. Um, it's not small electronic suit. devices. Right. Sub, sub $500 electronic consumer device, device consumer-facing services, software, what have you. Really not well known for that. So I spent a few days in the most beautiful setting and location you could ever imagine. I talked 
through the, the, the whole process, minus dates and times, at the end of our minus dates discussion, and times? minus dates and times, at the end of our discussion, we said, all right, let's put some dates and times on this. <laughs> and the speed with which we move here was illustrated greatly by the company saying to me, well, it will take three times that amount of time to do this. So you said like two years probably? And they oh, said no. Six. I said if you can't start from uh, a, a product brief to a product in production in 52 weeks, then we failed. Really? You do a one-year development cycle? One year, and you, you should be able to nail it at one year. Absolutely. Generation one product, you should be able to be in production in 52 weeks. And the design starts on day one. So you sit down with, an, with a blank Starts plate. with a brief. So your investigation phase, your marketing team, your business team, your research you're doing, all that is done in a pre-phase. When you say this is the specifications, the features, the functions, the things we want to build, okay, you 52 weeks or less, depending on what you're building. And what were they thinking of? Three years. Three years. <laughs> so it was very, uh, it was very educational but for me. But they're very accurate in measuring it. I'm sure of that. <laughs> I promise you that's true, yeah. So that never panned out, I guess, I think. Uh, no, no, absolutely. They're, they're moving down that path. But they're, oh, really? They're moving it. Uh, this was in June. Uh, it's now January of 2010. So it was arguably six or seven months ago. I had a wonderful conversation. I have colleagues working with them. And they're still as part of the investigative phase. We move pretty quickly. We really can move pretty quickly. The, the, here in the Valley, what you see, and hardware-wise, I'm a hardware guy, really. Um, our, our process and our ability to execute has continued to refine itself over time. And the teams that we can draw from, from companies like Apple and Microsoft and Dell and Cisco and all the host of others, have this experience of building things. Idea, development, production, life cycle. So we're pretty good at making sausage. We put the ingredients in, sausage comes out the other end. We're pretty good at that. Okay, so we know that your new company, Wimlabs, which we know will not be the name now, Yes. It's going to have a hardware component, otherwise you wouldn't be here. That's a, fair, that's a fair observation. And then you guys are quick at launching. So where are you now? Have you finished your product brief? Are you ready to get into production phase? Or are you still developing specs? We're still developing specs and doing engineering and doing research. We're, we really think and How many that, people are you now? Uh, well, <laughs> great question. Uh, less than 10. Or less I mean, than that means three guys in Chilling Valley usually. Well, it could be two. Uh, it could be me and one other person. <laughs> <laughs> and but I have, well, you have to remember, we're doing something really unique. And I, and I, I, I Everybody can't say says this. they're doing something unique. Well, first. let me, but I think I, can, I think I can qualify mine. Okay. I'm doing something very unique, and I say that in the context of how we're going to do it and not what we're going to do. Clearly, I'm not going to share with you what we're going to do, but I can say to you that our collective experience allows us to build a virtual team on a global scale that part of our innovation and part of our real creativity will become in the process we follow to go build this new product. We're going to do something really unique as it relates to tying together entities on a global level. It's very exciting. Tying together entities on a global level? Mm -hmm. You bet. We That's what Bush said when he went to Iraq. I mean, we, we, I have no we idea what that We can pull software means. guys from Holland. We can pull manufacturing guys from Taiwan. We can pull hardware guys uh, from Japan, we can pull technologies from almost every country in the world. And Meaning we'll in how you assemble together. your team and how you, how you produce Absolutely. your product, you mean? Absolutely correct. I thought actually you meant your product, but you still haven't said anything um, about your product. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so when can we expect something? Can you say that? It's like that's going to be 2011, 2012. Well, so, and, and I'm sure you know how this works. In the, in the consumer, we're going to build something consumer. That's kind of where I've spent most of my life, and I think yeah. it's really exciting. I think we can bring some value to the consumer world as the economy improves. And you know yourself, the consumer cycle really is about Q4. Yeah. So, so Q4 you, 2010, I'd love to have a follow-up conversation and have you That's say, pretty hey. quick then, but if you haven't finished your brief yet, and it should be in the stores at Q4 2010, it means your production cycle is much shorter than 52 weeks. As I said, we're going to do something really innovative and uh, state-of-the-art as it relates to... So you're still to going to launch it this year, and you still haven't finished your product specification. Absolutely correct. And it will be in the stores in Q4 of this year. It, it will be available... It will in be available. Yeah. So it will be, it will be sold over the internet. It will be available in Q4. <laughs> You're a master of deductive reasoning, I have to say. It's not what my girlfriend says, but I still think so. <laughs> what, is the, what is the most valuable lesson you've learned spending time as an entrepreneur and spending time then later, usually, after being acquired by these big companies? That's a great question. I, I think what you learn from the large companies, honestly, is, um, is, is how, to, how to build something. How do you go through a process? Large companies don't often get the credit that they deserve 
for following a process that allows you to weed out the problems and the issues of the product before you put it into production. That's a great thing for the consumer, and I don't think large companies get enough credit for that. I think Apple does a spectacular job of that. I think Xbox did a great job of that. Contrary to a lot of popular opinions and views, large companies go through a very, very careful process, allowing you to start with an idea and turn out a product that, could, that will be reliable and of a quality nature to the consumer. Of course, there's companies that don't, but you take the large companies and the majors, whether it's Sony or Samsung or others, they do a great job of doing this. What you learn from a startup company is you have to be able to say, we can do anything. And there are very few large companies that the DNA and the culture and the nature Usually of the company Usually they're too inwardly focused, I guess. Absolutely. And the process that they're in the Absolutely. business they're in and they don't look at the consumer Absolutely. demands or market demands. That's correct. And when you do a startup company, there's this, there's this tension that's always in place. Because you want to say, we can do anything. You want to have an open-mindedness and a willingness. Nonetheless, there are some boundaries you have to follow. You have to be able to execute. If you wander around Silicon Valley, there are lots and lots of companies or examples of companies that had spectacular ideas, spectacular technology they developed. They couldn't execute. So blending the ability to execute, which is the learnings that I got from large, working with large companies, with the willingness to say, we can do something truly unique and special and different, Blend those two things together. You take these wonderful ideas, these wonderful inventions, and you execute against them to bring them to the market to the consumer. That's the two lessons that I learned. And do you think that's something that most people, let's say that people in Europe should also try and do, work for big companies and work in small companies and then blend those experiences? I, I absolutely do. And I've provided, uh, through the years, I've, my advice and counsel to young engineers coming out of school is always do both. Try a consulting venture. Try a small company adventure. You will, you will learn to think differently. You will learn to break some of the rules. You will learn certain types of approaches to problems and issues that you won't necessarily get in a large company. When you go to a large company, there's huge value in understanding that to produce a product in very high volume and very high scale with high quality standards and reliability, it's hard. And it means you have to follow an execution plan and process. Blend the two together, I think you end up with the ability to do, to do product creation and realization and do it in a repeatable and reliable way. You're an investor. You understand how this works. When you make an investment in a company, you look for predictability. Can I predict the outcome that this team, who are incredibly bright and intelligent, can actually execute on their vision and dream? Mm -hmm. That's important. So by blending these two disciplines together, you get the best of both worlds. That's interesting because most people seem, in Europe seem to stick, you know, in one side of it. They, they try to stick either with big companies or they're mm -hmm. in startups. And they rarely cross over from one to the other. And they especially right. never move back and forth. Right. Which makes it very difficult when you have a conversation with those two people. Well, and maybe that's, uh, obviously, I live here and I don't understand the culture well enough. But some of that's being risk averse. And so some of the, some of the, the, uh, the energy that goes along with being in the Valley is this, this risk taking. There's clearly a risk associated with it. Which platform, that's my final question. Uh-huh. Which platform do you think will dominate the digital home? Right now, you, you were at Xbox. Yeah. There's yeah. the game consoles that everybody almost has in the house now, at least in families with kids. Yeah. There are cell phones now that can do pretty much anything that are basically portable computers, the iPhone, yeah. the Droid, the next, you know. It, so there's, mm -hmm. there's all this stuff. Is it going to be more stuff, more hardware, or is it going to merge into... I hope not. Well, I, I hope not. I, I, think, I think it's a very interesting question. It's something I've thought a lot about, having been having built set-top boxes, having built devices that connect your television in your home. What's the experience like? What's the connectivity? In the early phases of web TV, part of our struggles was just explaining to people how to put all the connectors in. I have a TV. I have a cable box or a satellite box. I have a web TV box. I have four boxes in this rack. How do I connect this? Yeah. It was really difficult and challenging. A lot of those problems have been solved. HDMI and new technologies coming forward has changed some of that. Yeah. New homes, wireless technology. Yeah, some of it. Most people just want to download movies off the internet yeah. in Holland for free. In the US, they'll pay for them. Right. And then uh, watch them on television. Well, and so I, you know, your question is a good one. I hope there isn't a continuing proliferation. Of course, everybody wants to dominate the home. We have seen everybody from Microsoft to the network operators and the MSOs, the cable guys yeah, and the, the satellite cable guys, guys are coming in, the computer guys coming in, you there's bet. the TV people. There's and the content folks. Yeah. And there's, there's kind of a, a, a real furball. I describe it as a furball in the home today. I had very high hopes that Apple uh, could do this. And the reason I say that is because they are masters at simplicity. Yeah. The iPod was a very simple product. 
it didn't have the bells and whistles of a lot of the competitive products it had. No, the Rio nonetheless, actually had more, so remember the creative digital stuff. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Nonetheless, the iPod prevailed because of its brilliance and simplicity. So bringing that simplicity to the home is important. I have to tell you, I just bought a new computer for my home, a 27-inch display all in one. I bought the remote control. I hit the play button. It brought up a 10-foot UI. I literally scooted back from my desk in my home office, and I looked at videos, and I looked at pictures, and it was a 10-foot UI that was brilliant in its simplicity and had all the pieces that could stitch it together. Of course, the problem is the plumbing and the infrastructure. Yeah. How do I get the content to that point? How do There's I still a computer the in your home office. You want to have it in the living room or in the den. I want that experience that I you want the just went through. Experience. I want that experience with its simplicity, its ease of use, to be migrated to my television and my family room. And one of the things we learned that was magical about web TV was people, when they sit down on their sofa at the end of the day or Saturday morning with mm -hmm. their children, or whenever you sit down there, you don't want to think about what you're doing. You want to navigate up, down, left, right, period. Mm -hmm. Channel and volume, period. You don't want to think. You don't want to do deliberate responses. You don't want to have a mouse on your TV. You don't want to have a keyboard on your lap while you're... You don't want to have a keyboard in your lap. You don't want to have an operating system there that, that, that makes you do this. So the answer to the question is? I'm a big fan of the... I'm a really big fan of the game console guys across the board. I think the game console guys have got the hardware. They've got the ability to do the software. They're migrating quickly to working with companies like Netflix in the U.S. and others. Yeah, because Netflix uh, is delivering movies. Absolutely. Over the internet. Um, and actually over cable. Yes. To, um, the, ex to the, absolutely the game correct. console owners. And that really is, the magic is about the content. But it hasn't happened in Europe yet. You know, we are, is that right? We have people that are playing Xbox 360, obviously. But it's not that there's... There's nobody streaming movies to, um, well, they're doing to set the boxes at the MSOs to stream right, themselves, right, right. but not to the game consoles. Right. It, I, I think the hardware exists there. I think the, for me personally, the game console guys understand it holistically better than anybody else. They, so then, but then it's Xbox because obviously Microsoft has basically killed Sony. Well, I think, I think Sony is struggling right now to be sure. I think Xbox has done a a great job with the second phase of Xbox 360. I think they've put a lot of, of, of time and energy and investment into understanding the home and the home consumer. I think they clearly understand software. They've, they've made tremendous efforts to talk to the plumbing guys, the people who actually provide the plumbing to get the content from point A to point B. The plumbing guys. I, well, that should be the telcos, but okay. Yeah. Right. So I'm a, I'm a fan of the, the, I would watch closely the game console guys. I think there's something there. And within there, do you think it's going to be Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft with the Xbox. I, I'm, I'm, if I was gonna, if you're asking me to make a bet today, yeah, I'd, I'd bet on my old friends at, at Microsoft. I would. Because these I guys think, have done something very amazing. I think it was the first time Microsoft came out with a Me Too product. Yes. That was better than the market leader. Well, they went from zero to number two overnight. Now. Yeah, but with a product, just I mean, technologically and the user experience of the Xbox absolutely. was a better, was a better machine. Yes. Better gaming experience than the PlayStation. I think. Yes. Two at the time. Was it PlayStation PS2. 2 it was up against? PS2. Yeah, PS2. And, uh, and that amazed me because Microsoft usually came out with a knockoff product that was worse. Well, and interestingly enough, you, you look at the progress that's been made, um, Sony owns a lot of content. That's true. Sony has a lot of content. Lot Nonetheless, of Microsoft has, has competed very, very effectively. So uh, I, I think if I had to, to put my $1 bet on the table with you today, I would probably bet on, my, on Microsoft at this point. I, I am... Part of that might be emotional too. I have a lot of friends that are still there. I respect the team that's that's doing the work that's there, and I think they they really. Uh, I think Steve Ballmer and the guys there under Robin Ross guidance can do this. And Steve Jobs and Apple. Well, I would love to see them really take this part of the market segment seriously. I really think. And they, they haven't can. done so far. It doesn't appear so. Uh, I think Apple TV so far hasn't really found its spot. I know they've got some great folks looking at it. I have a, again a lot of respect for what they're capable of doing. If I, I don't think it's a, it's that they've put their energy in, into this and failed. I think they haven't put their yeah. energy there yet. But if they decide to do that, I have uh, very, very high hopes and expectations they can do it very, very well. All right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you for your time. Take that. Appreciate it. Right, do you spend any time in Asia? No, and I haven't. And I don't like it. I'm half Asian. I don't like him. I was saying. <laughs> but I can say it. <laughs>